So, uh, the people will come and uh, so is it okay to begin now? Are you ready? I'm ready if you're ready. Uh, uh, hi everyone, welcome to APCTK stream seminar. It, it's a great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Thomas Banks. Uh, he is a professor in Rutgers University, and uh, as you know well, he made a great uh, achievement in string theory like a BFSS model. Today, he will give a talk about uh, this uh, JT gravity coupled to fermion. Please join me in welcoming our speaker, Professor uh, Thomas Banks. Okay, well, thank you for this invitation. Um, I, I understood from Zheng Yi that most people are fairly familiar with the uh, SYK model and uh, its connection to JT gravity. Uh, what you're going to hear in this talk is a very, very different uh, interpretation of the same set of models, but one which has a rather different geometrical picture. Uh, this is work that I did with Patrick Draper from the University of Illinois and my student, Bingnan Zhang, uh, who will be uh, joining a group in Beijing in the fall. Okay, so let me summarize the usual folklore about the so-called almost ADS2 CFT1 duality. So there's a model, it's actually a whole class of models, um, but we're going to be thinking about one particular model of out of that class chosen in a random way. So we're not going to be averaging over coupling constants. And uh, we're, we're thinking about one of the SYK models. And normally what you say about that is that the SYK models are dual to anti-de Sitter space with a string scale radius. And that the SYK operators live on the boundary at infinity of ADS2, except that when you are more careful about things, you see that things are not really conformally invariant. And there's a, actually a finite boundary and you have some calculations that are based on the fluctuations in the shape of the boundary. So this is a, a very active area of research. There are many, many papers about it. And uh, I've always been disturbed by the geometrical picture that was presented. And in particular, this idea that the ADS radius is the string scale. Let me, let me remind you about how that's usually argued for. You um, pretend that you're dealing with a conformal field theory dual, there's an approximate scale invariance, and you can identify operators. Uh, Gross and Rosenhaus, for example, did this in a very clear way. You can identify operators of fixed dimension, and you use the usual translation between operator dimension and the mass of fields in the ADS2 geometry. And uh, when you do that, you find a whole spectrum of fields, not just the fields that appear in the JT gravity model to which this is supposed to be dual. And there's no gap in that spectrum. The, the spectrum is just evenly spaced more or less. Uh, the, it's, it's not evenly spaced, but it's spaced by uh, amounts uh, of order one in ADS radius units. And, um, the usual thing we say about models like that in the ADS-CFT correspondence is that this means the ADS radius is a border of the string scale. But there's an issue with that, which is that the model was supposed to be a theory of the near horizon states of a large charge extremal Reissner Nordstrom black hole in four dimensions. And from the four dimensional point of view, we start out with Einstein gravity. We only have the Planck scale and the ADS radius is large in Planck units when the charge is large. 
So we're trying to study this problem that seems to have a completely large scale classical geometry with it, but the usual folklore says, no, no, that scale is string scale. So we're going to turn that around. Um, we're going to find an interpretation of things that allows you to, to talk about a classical large radius ADS space. And um, in order to do that, I'm going to have to go through a, a number of steps. So please bear with me. So JT gravity has two fields in it. It's got the two dimensional metric and it has a scalar field called the dilaton, which multiplies the square root of GR term in the uh, two dimensional gravity Lagrangian. And the model has a number of classical solutions, which have all the same geometry, the geometry is the geometry of ADS2 locally, exactly. And the scalar field is a function on the ADS2 manifold. And there's a particular set of coordinates in which that function is static, doesn't depend on the time. And that, um, <clears throat> that set of coordinates has a, a horizon in it. And the metric looks as shown here, it's got a standard Schwarzschild type horizon at a point R equals RS. And the scalar field in that uh, a geometry has uh, the, the form that's linear, it's a constant plus a linear term in R minus RS. In the usual way of thinking about this, the way we get to JT gravity is taking the four dimensional Einstein action, reducing it to spherically symmetric solutions, and then going very near the horizon of ADS, the solution in four dimensions is ADS two times S two, where the two uh, geometries have the same radius of curvature. And the uh, what happens is if you go a little bit away from the horizon, the radius of the sphere grows because out at infinity, it is um, asymptotically flat space. And so you get a, a formula for the dilaton field S of R, which has the form that I wrote here, except I've written it deliberately with a minus sign. Um, and we're going to see that that's really important for our interpretation of the uh, model. The way you should think about that is the plus sign that you see in the usual set of coordinates is, uh, should be thought about as uh, coming about by going away from the horizon in the asymptotically flat direction. Whereas what we're going to be studying is sort of what's going on right near the horizon and blowing it up. So let's uh, let, let allow me that minus sign for the moment and we'll go on. Now in these formulas, I've taken the ADS radius to be equal to one and all the parameters that appear in these classical solutions are dimensionless. So RS, R is a dimensionless coordinate. Um, <clears throat> Rs is a, uh, um, a uh, dimensionless horizon position, and mu squared is dimensionless, and S naught is dimensionless. And I want you to recall that S originates in this model from four dimensions as related to the area of a four dimensional sphere. Okay. Now, I'm going to tell you something about field theory coupled to JT gravity. And for the moment, let's just think about classical field theory. In our paper, we studied very, very carefully classical solutions of a model where I took fermions, coupled them to JT gravity, 
and then bosonize the fermions so that it becomes a bunch of massless scalar fields coupled to JT gravity, and you can study classical solutions. And there are properties of those solutions which are very, very generic for any field theory in the JT gravity background. So let me tell you what those are. <clears throat> Let's look at the value of the stress tensor in any solution. So in general, that'll be time dependent. The energy and momentum will flow around in ADS2 space. But um, the uh, ADS2 stress tensor will not, of course, escape to infinity in ADS2. The stress energy always bounces off the horizon with the usual boundary conditions that we use. And um, the time in ADS units that it takes, um, where time, let me uh, emphasize, time is this time over here in this metric. So we're doing gravity. You have to specify what time you're talking about. We're talking about time in these coordinates. The time in these coordinates that stress energy stays far away from the horizon, a distance of order one or greater in ADS units from the horizon is finite and it's of order one. So if I have even outward moving stress energy, it bounces off the boundary at infinity. And in a time of order one, it comes back to it within a distance much, much less than one from the horizon. It never quite gets to the horizon. This is the familiar red shifting of anything that goes near a horizon. Uh, all frequencies start to go to zero. Um, now, this is something that should actually be familiar to you from black holes in higher dimensional ADS space. If I take something from the boundary in higher dimensional ADS space and send it in towards the black hole, then it hits the black hole and in fact hits the black hole singularity in a time of order one in ADS radius units. The difference between the two dimensional case and higher dimensional cases is that in higher dimensions, if I throw particles into infinity to an ADS black hole, they can miss the black hole. And typically they will miss the black hole unless you aim them correctly. But here, since there's only one spatial dimension, everything that I throw in gets reabsorbed by the black hole. So in the time of order one, you find that there's, no matter what initial conditions you choose, you find that there is no stress energy concentrated any place except right near the horizon. <clears throat> now, I'm not going to tell you the details of this. You can look it up in our paper. I'll tell you in words what we did. We studied the theory of massless fermions coupled to JT gravity as a quantum field theory. And JT gravity has a particular feature that makes that particularly simple, which is that given of two different methods of quantization, <clears throat> you find that the um, metric of ADS2 doesn't change. It is not a fluctuating quantum variable, okay? And um, the, as a consequence of that, because the fermions are coupled only to the gravitational field and not to the S field, the uh, fermions just behave like massless fermions in an ADS2 background. And that's an exactly soluble theory because massless fermions are conformally invariant and up to issues having to do with boundary conditions, the ADS2 background is conformal to Minkowski space. Of course, because it has a different curvature that introduces singularities and so on. And we have dealt with those boundary condition issues. Um, but basically we can solve the problem by solving the theory in Minkowski space, imposing the proper boundary conditions 
and then studying what happens to that theory. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. On here, AGS2, uh, like uh, in like uh, nearly AGS2, it has like a boundary, like a Schwarzschild mode, or this boundary fluctuating. Even though 2D gravity is uh, like, uh, as you said, it's trivial because there's no propagating theory of freedom, and uh, it could be used at AGS, but uh, the, my, the boundary, like uh, infinity, is uh, already non trivial. So, is there some coupling between the boundary mode of the uh, AGS2 with the fermion? Okay, so th that is not the case in the way that we solved the model. And um, as, as you'll see, um, we're going to get out results for the thermodynamic partition function, um, which are essentially identical to the results that everybody else gets for this problem. Um, but uh, we do not actually have the Schwarzian mode in the model. Um, more generally than that, we do not have a quantization of any of the fields of classical JT gravity. Um, with that's, I, I have to modify that statement a little bit. Um, so as I said, for us, the metric is exactly ADS2. It does not fluctuate. And in, in addition to that, these parameters the RS and the mu squared and S, S naught, of course, nobody thinks fluctuates it because a constant term in S is just a topological term in the action. So it doesn't fluctuate, but none of the parameters are allowed to fluctuate. So other people have studied JT gravity as an exactly soluble theory and JT gravity coupled to various um, conformal field theories. But um, an example is the work of Harlow and Jefferis. Those people always quantized the modes of the gravitational field. We do not do that. We treat them as classical fixed parameters. One way you should think about this is it's similar to what we do in higher dimensional string theory. So in higher dimensional string theory, when we talk about the, um, gravitational sector, we, we have boundary conditions on the graviton, the dilaton, and so on. And those are left as moduli of the theory. They're just fixed, and we study the model for each value of those parameters, okay? Um, one of the things that Harlow and Jefferis pointed out happens if you insist on quantizing the parameters of the JT gravity solutions. There's a standard way to do that using um, covariant quantization methods, and you can do it and you get an answer, but that answer doesn't satisfy factorization. So the geometry that we're talking about looks like a black hole. And in fact, it can be analytically continued through the horizon. And there's another copy of the black hole with opposite time orientation on the other side. It's just like any standard black hole in crystal like coordinates. And what you find is that the, what that geometry is begging you to do is to think about it as Werner Israel first uh, proposed in the 1970s as a thermofield double calculation. And what Harlow and Jaffera showed is that when you quantize the um, parameters of JT gravity, the parameters in the solution, you violate the factorization. The, the thermal field double path integral by construction is supposed to factorize into a path integral for two different models and we're just purifying the thermal state of one by entangling it with the other one. That doesn't happen if you quantize the gravitational modes. We do not do that. We do have factorization. Now, the way we've solved the model is the following. There's an old fashioned method due to Julian Schwinger, 
which goes as follows. You write down the classical equations of motion. <clears throat> we went a little further than that in that we wrote down the classical equations of motion, including the terms that come from the conformal anomaly for the, um, for the fermions in the background gravitational field. And you write down the, those classical equations of motion. And then you try, you also have time translation invariance. So you can use Noether's theorem to construct a Hamiltonian. And you try to invent commutation relations for your fields such that all of the classical equations of motion follow as the Heisenberg equations of motion of that Hamiltonian with those commutation relations. <clears throat> when we did that, we found that we could do that and that the um, metric remained, we, we assumed that the metric remained just ADS2. And then if you did that, the scalar field equation of motion followed from the fermion equations of motion um, just by manipulating the fermion equations of motion. So the scalar field in our way of thinking about things is not an independent dynamical variable. It has a classical piece which you can take to be parameterized by the parameters I showed you. And then there's another piece that's determined by expectation values of fermion by linears. Another way to quantize the model is to do Euclidean path integrals. That's of course much more familiar in modern times. And when you do the Euclidean path integrals, again, we do them only using the Euclidean geometries that lead to a factorized thermofield double. And when you do that, you find that the ADS2 geometry is fixed equal to ADS2 by the integral over the, the um, dilaton field, the fluctuating part of the dilaton field. And you again find an exact solution which coincides uh, once you take care of an important renormalization, it coincides with the um, uh, results we got from doing Schwinger's method. Uh, the renormalization I'm talking about is the renormalization of the constant term in S. The fermion path integral leads to an infinite additive renormalization of S naught. And um, <clears throat> We're going to be talking a lot about that. Okay. Now, I'm going to be using a very, very particular interpretation of the field S, which um, follows, if you think about the, the model as coming from four dimensions, it just follows because S was really the area of the transfer sphere, the, the area that gives the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. Um, that, that was just true in four dimensions. So you should really think of the constant value of S as an entropy. But there's a, a really rather more general argument for why you should think of S as an entropy, and which also tells you why you should think about the uh, gravitational and dilaton field in this model as classical fields. This is basically an old idea of Ted Jacobson's from 1995. Um, there's a paper by Jacobson called the Einstein Equation of State. If any of you has not read that paper, uh, you should read it. I think it's one of the most important papers in our attempts to understand quantum gravity. And what Jacobson did was he said, and I'm, I'm using language that's slightly anachronistic because back in 1995, the term holographic screen of a causal diamond did not exist. But what effectively Jacobson said is if you make the assumption that um, comes from the work of Fischler, Susskind, and Busso, 
that we should think about the area of the holographic screen of a causal diamond as um, the area divided by four in Planck units as being an entropy. And you locally apply the first law of thermodynamics to that entropy formula. You reproduce Einstein's equations, everything except the cosmological constant. So there's something similar you can do in two dimensions. In two dimensions, of course, diamond boundaries are points. The space-like boundaries of diamonds are just points. There's no such thing as area. So what you say instead is, okay, if I have a causal diamond in some two-dimensional Lorentzian geometry, I need to have a function S on that diamond that tells me what the entropy is for as I change the proper time in the diamond. And now you, you rerun Jacobson's argument. You say, okay, I want to write whatever this S field is. I want to write the equation in, um, for S that follows from the first law of thermodynamics, DE equals TDS. And you get the following pair of equations. The covariant derivative with respect to the metric of the S is equal to the T plus plus component of the stress tensor. And you're doing this purely hydrodynamically. So you do, you're not modeling that as the stress tensor of some quantum system. It's just a stress tensor. And the same thing for the minus minus co components. And then in addition, you insist that these equations should follow from covariant or, or should be consistent with covariant conservation of the stress tensor TAB, which is equivalent to saying that we should be able to derive these equations as some of the equations of motion following from a generally covariant action. And then what you find is, since these equations only involve second derivatives of the field, you reduce the uh, action to something that depends only on second derivatives. And the most general form you could write down is called dilaton gravity. Um, you've, the S field is the linear thing that multiplies the uh, Riemann Cur the Ricci curvature scalar. And then there are these other two terms that involve only S multiplied by the square root of minus G. You can do vial transformations that mostly get rid of this F of S. There are some restrictions on that. And of course, in, in JT gravity, F of S is set equal to zero and uh, G of S is set equal to S. So that JT gravity is a special case of the general linear general dilaton gravity Lagrangian that basically follows from hydrodynamics. So what do we learn from both Jacobson's derivation and this one? It's that in general, you should not think of the gravitational field or the, the dilaton field as um, fundamental quantum variables, they are the fields of hydrodynamics. Now that's not inconsistent with the way we usually think of gravitons and dilatons in string theory, because if I take a rather generic system and I look at it near its ground state and for small fluctuations around the ground state, very often the low energy excitations are just quantization of the linearized hydrodynamic equations. And that's how we know that, quote, we should quantize gravity in string theory. But the, the message of Jacobson is that that should be thought of in the way it's thought of in condensed matter physics. The phonon is not a fundamental degree of freedom. It follows from whatever the fundamental degrees of freedom are. And again, this also tells you that what should entropy be? Well, entropy in hydrodynamics comes out by counting the states of the fundamental degrees of freedom. So it, it usually in the usual kind of hydrodynamics, if I think about a local system, I take a 
region that's large in microscopic units. And I look at all of the energy eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian restricted to that region. And there's a spectrum that includes very, very tiny level spacings because there are many, many levels in general. And then you, you um, the, the hydrodynamic variables have a natural time scale associated with them. And you just um, smear over energy differences that are smaller than the inverse hydrodynamic time scale. And you get an entropy function, which is the, um, the entropy that appears in the phenomenological hydrodynamic equations. So that function is expected to be an auxiliary field determined in terms of the stress tensor of the dynamical variables. And if I can remind you what I just said about our way of quantizing field theory coupled to JT gravity, the, um, uh, the dilaton field S has exactly that property. The dilaton has its classical part plus a piece that's determined by the expectation value of Fermi on bar linears in whatever state you're in. Okay. So we now have a way of a soluble model of quantum field theory <coughs> and a way of thinking about it as describing JT gravity coupled to fermions. But there are problems with this if we think of it as a model of quantum gravity. And there are two problems. Um, they're, they're quite different problems, but they're, um, they're problems that are uh, solved by the same set of tricks. So the first problem is, of course, that since we're doing a field theory, the, if I look in any finite region, any causal diamond, the entropy of that causal diamond is infinite, okay? This showed up in our calculations in field theory because of the infinite renormalization of the S naught field in the, say, the path integral way of quantizing this theory. So there's an infinite entropy, but we're trying to model an extremal Reister Nordstrom black hole of finite charge. And that has finite entropy. And we expect that means it's describable by a finite dimensional Hilbert space. Um, so that's problem number one. The second problem, which in some sense is even more serious, is that this model, as we've described it, has an infinite number of conservation laws. And, and that's true of anybody's way of solving these um, models of JT gravity coupled to conformal field theories. The, the conformal field theories always have an infinite number of conservation laws, and uh, those are not violated by JT gravity. And yet, we have only thermal states. In models that really have an infinite number of conservation laws, integrable models, there are generalized thermal ensembles in which you fix the values of all of the different conservation laws. Here you are thinking of a Peter Sora type of the infinite the uh, symmetry, right? Excuse me, say it again. Uh, here, when you say infinite number of conservation law, are, do you think of the, this type of like a 2D Birasora type of the symmetry or- For example, number? yes, for example, in, the, in these fermion models, the free fermion model, there are even more conservation laws than that. I see. Um, so, so the Virasoro conservation laws would be there in any CFT. The free fermion models are even more integrable than that. Okay, but any set of conservation laws besides energy is inconsistent with thinking that the only parameters of the of the uh, equilibrium states are just sort of a temperature and an entropy. Okay, you should have you know, chemical potentials uh, that are uh, 
related to all of the infinite conservation laws. So I'm going to <clears throat> solve both of these problems with a pair of known mappings. Uh, you can call them dualities if you want, um, between uh, three different sets of things. The first is a mapping that was discovered uh, in the, uh, the second renaissance of old matrix models by Alexandrov, Kazakov, and Kostov. Um, I expect most of you don't know about this mapping, but I, it's very easy to explain, and I'll explain it to you in a minute. And uh, it's a local mapping of vial fermions in Minkowski space. You need both left moving and right moving vial fermions into a model of non relativistic fermions moving in an upside down harmonic oscillator potential. So, this AKK mapping um, you, is probably an unfamiliar, but I'm about to explain it. It's very simple. <clears throat> then there's something from the history of old matrix models. Um, this is fabulous work, a first uh, in work done by Grazan, Itzikson, Parisi, and Zubair in um, the 1980s. And then uh, it was followed up by Brezhan, Kazakov, and Zamolodzikov, who studied the double scaled limit of what um, Brezhan, Itzikson, et al. did. <clears throat> and finally, um, my Rutgers colleague, Greg Moore, formalized this all in a very, very um, beautiful, a rigorous description of the fermionic non-relativistic field theory in the minus y squared potential um, and showed the all of these papers show how that's related to what's called the double scaled limit of a model of matrix quantum mechanics. <clears throat> so essential to what we're doing it will be the fact that if I take the matrix, the double scaled limit of matrix quantum mechanics involves partially a large N limit, a large N limit of the matrices. And um, we're, to, in order to get a model of quantum gravity, we're going to have to take N finite. And then I told you about this minus Y squared potential. When you take N finite, um, in order to actually make sense of the model, you need to um, cut off the minus y squared potential by making it the maximum in a double well potential. And um, we will solve the problem of infinite conservation laws by adding uh, interactions that are localized at the bottom of the double, double well potential. <clears throat> and we'll see geometrically that that means these interactions are localized near the horizon of the JT gravity solution. Those will be the things that make the spectrum chaotic and thermalize the integrable model and give rise to the fact that there are only thermal states and nothing else. So now let me proceed to describe some of the technicalities. First, the AKK map. This is really beautiful and trivial. Okay, so here's the, um, the Lagrangian of a theory of non-relativistic fermions in an upside down oscillator potential. What I've done is I've just defined variables U and V, which are P plus Y and P minus Y, where Y is the upside down oscillator coordinate and P its canonical momentum. Those variables are canonically conjugate to each other, and the upside down oscillator looks like UV plus VU in those variables. So this is the Lagrangian, I integrate the action, I integrate over T and over Y. Now I'm going to choose, since these variables are canonically conjugate, I should choose the fields to depend on one of them or the other of them. 
And when I do that, the other variable becomes a derivative operator. And then you can just change variables to find a new variable x, which is if you've taken psi to depend on u, it's log of u, or if you've taken it to be v, it's log of v, and redefine the field psi to be u to the minus a half times capital psi, or v to the minus a half times capital psi. This is a great exercise to do for yourself. It's really fun and simple. And it leads you to the Viol equation in Minkowski space. So the upside down oscillator field theory of non-relativistic fermions is exactly the same as Viol fermions in Minkowski space. Now, because we've got both U and V here, there are two ways of thinking about this, either as functions of u or functions of v. And that gives me both left moving and right moving vial fermions. And of course, there's got to be some connection between them because they all came from the original model. What that connection is depends on what system you're trying to model. So this map was first introduced by AKK studying what's known as linear dilaton gravity. That's a different version of two-dimensional dilaton gravity that actually has a Minkowski space as its geometry. In a similar way to what I said here, the geometry is exactly Minkowski, no fluctuations. And in addition, there's a dilaton field, which has a different dependence on the static coordinates in Minkowski space. That theory naturally has an S matrix interpretation. The left moving fermions come in and they bounce and they come back as right moving fermions. That S matrix can be computed exactly from the solutions of the upside down harmonic oscillator problem. And um, it, they're essentially given by the uh, etuft, sorry about that. By the etuft S matrix, because the left moving coordinates and the right moving coordinates are canonically conjugate to each other as Atuft argued the uh, ingoing and outgoing coordinates at any horizon should be. I'm not going to go into the details about that. I'm not talking about linear dilaton gravity today. Um, there are beautiful papers on that from the 1990s. And I wrote an update on those papers in 2015 and again in 2020 or 21. Um, which you can read for the details about that. <clears throat> so now let me def describe the matrix model duality. So what we basically do is we start from the quantum mechanics of a single n by n permission matrix in a double well potential with a single trace Lagrangian. Notice this matrix lives only in a time dimension. The theory is holographic in the sense that the space coordinates that I've been talking about up till now will emerge from the dynamics of this theory. In this case, they emerge in a very simple way. This has been known forever. What you basically do is the matrix model as written has a unitary invariance. I can conjugate the matrix M by any unitary transformation. It leaves the action invariant. This is treated as a gauge symmetry. Only the U and singlets are physical in this model. Um, for this simple quantum mechanics model, the only statement of gauge symmetry is that I restrict attention to singlets. <clears throat> So now what you can do is you can use this invariance to exactly integrate out the U. So write M equals U dagger DU. 
where U is the gauge transformation and D is a diagonal matrix. <clears throat> then the Lagrangian turns into a sum of Lagrangians for the eigenvalues of the matrix, which have exactly the same form. They're eigenvalue dot squared over two minus the potential evaluated at the eigenvalue. And then you integrate out the U variable exactly, and that turns out to give <clears throat> um, what's called a Bandermann determinant. Now, when we've done this, we originally started with the UN gauge symmetry. There's a residual gauge symmetry, even of the diagonal matrix under SN permutations. That's exactly the gauge symmetry of particle statistics. If I think of these as N independent particles moving in one dimension, and here's where the one dimension of space has emerged holographically in this model. So the SN gauge symmetry is particle statistics. And if you take the Vandermond determinant into account, that makes it, it, it forces the wave functions to be anti-symmetric rather than symmetric under this symmetry. And therefore the particles are identical particles, but they're fermions. So it shows that a matrix model of this type is exactly equivalent. So quantum mechanics of a single matrix is exactly equivalent to N fermions where N is the rank of the matrix uh, living in a space dimension that originates as the eigenvalues of the matrix and having a potential V. And they are all non-interacting and they move in the same potential. <clears throat> now to take this so-called double scaled limit, what you do in any model with N fermions, of course, there are some parameters. So one of the important parameters is the curvature of the double well potential near its maximum. That turns out to be the parameter that is essentially up to numerical factors. It's the ADS radius. So we're going to set that curvature equal to one. Um, and then the other important parameter in the model of fermion, non-interacting fermions in the potential is where the Fermi surface is. <clears throat> so, well, where the Fermi surface is depends on the number of fermions. So as you take N to infinity, the Fermi surface is moving up. And what you do to get the so-called double scaled limit is you take the limit N goes to infinity with the Fermi surface approaching the maximum of the, maximum of the potential, but you also tune the potential so that the maximum is, is always just above the Fermi surface, okay? And then you get a model which was shown um, to be in, in the case where I allow the uh, potential to be a upside down, oscillator potential all the way out to infinity. Um, this has a scattering theory in it that is identical to the scattering theory of one plus one dimensional string theory. And um, it's an exact solution of one plus one dimensional string theory in a linear dilaton background. <clears throat> now there's a parameter left over in the model, which is the when, when you take a limit like this, where you're sort of taking the Fermi surface up to the maximum, but making the maximum run away, in the limit, you get left over with a renormalized parameter that tells you how far away from that infinitely high maximum the, the Fermi surface actually is. And if that, in the linear dilaton models, if I take that distance to be very large, then there's a perturbative solution of the models, which coincides exactly with string perturbation theory. And if I take it to be basically the Fermi surface right at the top, then in those linear dilaton models, the gravitational 
uh, structure of the models looks like it's unmodified, as if there is no string scale. Everything is just determined by the scale of this upside down harmonic oscillator potential. So we're going to be thinking about that second version of things. We wanna be thinking about something that is not a string scale geometry, but a geometry that is large and classical. Okay. So, so far, everything that I told you has to do with Minkowski space. But now I'm going to adapt the AKK formalism to anti de Sitter space. And the point is that up to the conformal anomaly, I can make a mapping of massless fermions in ADS2 to massless fermions in Minkowski space. The only difference is I have to worry about boundary conditions. The place that mapping goes wrong is at the boundaries at infinity. Since AKK is a local mapping in space, I can apply this mapping to ADS2, and I can then um, study what happens and figure out what the right boundary conditions are. So the way we did that, this is the most conjectural part of what we did. It's based on what I did in my 2015 paper on linear dilaton gravity. Um, there are two quantities that you can calculate in the geometry. Uh, one of them is uh, given a, um, given a, a uh, um, let, me, let me go to a picture, hold on a second. So we're gonna be thinking about uh, a situation that looks like this. We have um, this geometry that I talked about. Um, there's a horizon of the geometry, a past and future horizon. Those are the R equals RS surfaces. And here's the boundary at infinity, the usual ADS infinite boundary. We're going to be thinking about causal diamonds with one tip on the boundary at infinity and the other tip at some position R, which is bigger than RS. Okay. So in those causal diamonds, we can think about two quantities. We can think about how much time it will take to fall from this position R to um, this uh to to the to the horizon and we can also ask how much time it'll take a massless particle because we're dealing with massless fermions to fall to the horizon and we can also ask about how much entropy there is inside of this causal diamond as a function of r we will use the interpretation of the dilaton as the entropy to say that the entropy should be this formula that I wrote down. Here I've written the constant A so that it's not manifestly positive. Um, you'll see in a minute why I want it to be manifestly positive. Um, and now we have the time to fall. So here is our mapping of the time to fall. This is on the right-hand side of this equation is the time as calculated in the ADS2 geometry to fall from a point R to the point RS, okay? And um, I'm sorry, I said it incorrectly. What, what I'm calculating is the time to fall from infinity to the point R, okay? And the uh, notice as the point R approaches RS, that blows up logarithmically. On the other hand, if I think about fermions in an upside down oscillator, I can think classically about the transit time of the fermions 
to start at the top of the potential and fall down to a point U, okay? And U zero is the place, if I start at the top of the potential, of course, I don't move. And if I, uh, if I start a little bit away, um, then, I, then I do move and the time it takes to fall to U equals infinity is logarithmic in U and that matches this logarithm here. So that tells us that the way we should be mapping the oscillator coordinate onto the geometrical coordinate is very different from what happened in the linear graviton models, the linear dilaton models. In the linear dilaton models, u equals infinity corresponded to x equals infinity. And that was where scattering states came in from or went out to. Here, u is going to, at equals infinity is going to be the horizon. And the top of the potential is going to be the thing that I think of as the, um, I, that I think of as the boundary at infinity. And we'll see just as in, in the oscillator model, you can't really start right at the top of the potential because the equation of motion for u is u equals u zero times the exponential of t. And so if u zero is zero, you don't go anywhere. Um, so you have to start a little bit away and correspondingly, we'll see in a minute that we can't really go out to the boundary of ADS. <clears throat> and the reason for that is the following. The meat of our calculation was to find a density matrix in the non-relativistic fermion system such that the entropy is calculated in that density matrix quantum mechanically in the WKB approximation was equal to the entropy formula of linear dilaton gravity where the entropy I'm referring to is the entropy in this little red diamond. Now, remember I told you that if I look at classical solutions of our field theory or any other field theory, that if I take some stuff and start it off moving in any direction, in a time of order one, it ends up very, very close to the horizon. It never actually gets there. This is the familiar tortoise coordinate phenomenon. Um, it, but it, it gets very, very close. So you might have thought there's no entropy at all in this diamond, but this model semi-classically has Hawking radiation in it. And so Hawking radiation says that these horizons are constantly emitting particles that go out to the boundary and bounce off. And so you might not be surprised to find then that at equilibrium, there's some finite probability for particles to be in this little red diamond. Though you might expect that as I take R out to infinity, that probability will go to zero. That's exactly what this formula does. If I look at this formula and I take A to be positive, as I've insisted, then if S naught is finite, I can't go all the way out to infinity, okay? Because the entropy becomes zero at a finite value of R. Where that value is depends on what S naught is. It's very, very far from RS um, if S naught is very, very large, okay? So the uh, main calculation that we did was to find a quantum mechanical density matrix rho such that its entropy gave you the same formula using this relationship between time and radius and u. So this relationship gives you a relationship between u and r. This relationship gives you an entropy as a function of r and both relationships have to match. So we did that. The way we did it is by using a familiar, I hope, 
uh, formalism from non-relativistic quantum mechanics, the so-called Moyal formalism, in which you can write operator quantum mechanics in terms of functions on phase space with a funny definition of what the product of functions is. And the trace of an operator is just one over pi times an integral over phase space of the corresponding Moyal function that corresponds to the operator. I've written our phase, the phase space of our model as a little in a slightly funny way. Instead of using U and V as the coordinates, I used U and the energy because the energy is conserved. Okay. And you can do that just as well. Now, the, the trick of the Moyal formalism is that there is a product on functions on phase space, which gives you exactly the same algebra as the product of quantum mechanical operators. It's a non-commutative product on function space. But in the WKB approximation, you can treat all functions as if they're commuting. So that's basically what I'm doing. And what, if you study it, and I'm not going to have time to, to argue this to you, but if, if you go out to large U, the WKB approximation is always going to be good. And what we're going to find is that the entropy of our density matrix is all concentrated at large U. And therefore, um, the WKB approximation should be a good approximation. Um, we uh, are hoping that either we or somebody else will check that WKB is really okay for this. So as I said, I match the time formula and the entropy formula, and I choose a thermal looking density matrix, except I allow the temperature to depend on U. And we get a matching. And here's what the matching looks like. A, I'm sorry, I used the same, oh, nasty. Okay. So A is, I, on the previous slide, A was a constant, okay? But what I mean by A on this slide is A of R is S of R over S naught, where S of R is this function here. So here I've restored the constant to be called mu squared. And I apologize for not realizing that um, mistake. Um, at any rate, with this uh, identification, we can write a mapping between the U coordinate and uh, the R coordinate that's given by this formula. Now, there are a bunch of identifications in this formula. These exponents, A, B, C, and D, are, um, are uh, uh, functions of two parameters, alpha and gamma. And alpha is given by something that um, scales like the number of fermions. It's like the fermion entropy squared, the maximal entropy squared, divided by the number of fermions. There are two um, nu numerical constants, I1 and I2, that come out as integrals over the Fermi distribution once you've extracted all the dimensionful parameters from it. And then the parameter mu squared appears in alpha as well. And then gamma is given in terms of the parameters of the classical solution of JT gravity. So to summarize what we've done, is we've found a, uh, a quantum mechanical problem that can be mapped onto fermions traveling in the um, geometry given by JT gravity. There is, as I said, a cutoff on the ADS2 geometry. It's a rigid cutoff at a fixed value of R which is determined by the zero of this entropy function. And um, the, the, uh, um, the uh, uh, 
the, the mapping is such that on the one hand, by using the AKK map, we can study states of the uh, uh, system which are not at equilibrium, which have lots of energy for a short time far away from the horizon, which then falls back to the horizon. But we can also construct density matrices, which give rise to the proper thermal density matrices for the relativistic fermions. And the mapping between geometry and the non-relativistic fermion problem is quite explicit. So I've explained the meaning of this diagram. This was just to explain to you what entropy we're calculating. <clears throat> so what are the consequences of this? The consequences are that the equilibrium states are all concentrated near the horizon. These states that we've written down, these, this density matrix, if you work out the, what the uh, mappings tell you and what beta of u is, um, the, uh, yeah, I, there's a, an intermediate step in this mapping in which you also determine what beta of u is. So that, that leads you to the mapping between u and r. And beta of u um, always um, goes to uh, zero at uh, u goes to infinity. And so the equilibrium states are all concentrated near the horizon, but we can find transient states with energy in the bulk. Uh, there's a technical point compared to the use of the AKK map to uh, study Minkowski space, we have to impose just using the even wave functions of the upside down harmonic oscillator problem. That's an exact symmetry of the problem. You can think of this as a, a gauge restriction on the problem. It's, um, it's, not a, it's not a problem. To get finite entropy, we have to retreat from the double scaling limit. The theory is a theory of n by n matrices in an upside down oscillator potential. Now that doesn't by itself give you a finite dimensional Hilbert space because the coordinates can still go out to infinity, but you can put an ultraviolet cutoff on the single particle energies. And because our density matrices um, are ultraviolet soft because of the, the exponential, this doesn't affect our density matrices. So we can actually make a finite dimensional Hilbert space that whether or not you think of the Hilbert space as infinite dimensional, all of these density matrices give finite entropy, which is what we expect for near extremal black holes. Now, finally, to deal with the problem of uh, integrability, we've now mapped the horizon not to infinity in the oscillator coordinate, but to the minimum of the double well potential. So you can, in, term, in the fermion language, you can add additional SYK type multi-fermion couplings localized near the minimum. Those will give rise to the usual SYK density matrix. So the density matrices that I've written should really be thought of as the density matrices that describe what's going on far from the horizon, not exactly at the horizon, because in the real quantum gravity model, we cut off the, um, the model, the quantum model that I studied over here, we cut that off and we add these SYK interactions, but the density matrices that we've calculated show you that from the point of view of bulk physics, all of the entropy is concentrated near the horizon. And so the actual partition function will be dominated by the SYK interactions and it'll give you the usual SYK results. Um, 
<clears throat> the SYK uh, interactions thought of in matrix language are multi-trace uh, corrections to the matrix model action. There's nothing wrong with multi-trace interactions and they're scaled in such a way that they don't interfere with taking a large and limit. Something that might disturb some of you is that we can put in just about any SYK interaction that you like. And there's also some freedom in exactly how we choose to cut things off and so on, which double well potential we use. All of those things give me slightly different models. I don't think that that's a worry. I think if I think about a two-dimensional gravity model, I can think about it in two ways. Number one, I can think about two-dimensional gravity. So what we're, what we're discovering here is there are many, many different um, two-dimensional gravity models that have the same basic hydrodynamics. They have the same JT gravity description of what goes on in the bulk, okay? The, um, <clears throat> the other thing that might worry you as well, we're talking about extremal Reissner Nordstrom black holes. And the way I think about that is that there are many, many consistent compactifications of string theory to four dimensions with one or more U1 gauge fields in addition to gravity in four dimensions. So there are many, many consistent models of quantum gravity, which will have extremal Reissner Nordstrom black holes in them. One should not expect that all of those have exactly the same microscopic dynamics. So I think of the large number of possible models from the string theory point of view as reflecting the diversity of string compactifications to four dimensions with U1 gauge symmetries. So what are the conclusions of this investigation? First of all, we've constructed a model in which a large charge extremal Reissner Nordstrom black hole has a large radius ADS2 geometry. We have described quantum models which can actually reproduce the semi-classical physics of relativistic fermions moving in that geometry. In those models, we also have SYK interactions, but the SYK models describe only the near horizon physics at radii much less than the ADS radius. Our model also describes transient states in the bulk. The fact that the SYK interactions and if you think about things in this way, this is where you should think of the fermions as living, okay? The fermions live at the bottom of the double well potential most of the time. And this teaches us a lesson about holography. In the usual ADS CFT correspondence, what we do is we have an infinite reservoir of states at infinity. We throw them into the bulk and then they come out the, uh, in higher dimensions, they come out the other side of the bulk. Maybe there's a black hole in the middle and some of them will get caught in that black hole and the black hole is big enough to be stable and we'll never see them again. Be, but the, the basic physics is that most of the states of the system are concentrated on the boundary. So that's where the hologram is. In this model, the semi-classical physics tells you that most of the states in equilibrium, most of the states of the system are concentrated not in the bulk, not on the boundary, but near the horizon. And so you put the hologram where the entropy is. Um, a, another interesting feature, I don't completely know um, what to make of this is that uh, both in this work and the earlier work I did on linear dilaton gravity, even in the double scaling limit, to map to cl classical geometry, you have to use the WKB approximation because in order to make the map between classical geometry and 
the um, motion of fermions, you have to define a transit time for the fermions and relate that to a time traversing a certain causal diamond in the bulk. And the, that transit time in quantum mechanics is not a usually well-defined quantity. It is in the WKB approximation. So in some sense, even in the double scaling limit, classical geometry is somehow emergent in that it seems to require the WKB approximation to the quantum mechanics. The final lesson is that in these models, just as in string theory models in higher dimensions, we don't quantize the parameters of the classical gravity solutions. In higher dimensions, the reason for that is we think of those <coughs> as asymptotic boundary conditions that can't be changed by any S matrix process or um, in ADS CFT by any action of local operators in the conformal field theory. Um, in these uh, systems, the reason you don't quantize the parameters is because the parameters of the classical gravity solutions are describing bulk thermodynamic features of the equilibrium ensembles of the model. You do not quantize bulk thermodynamics or bulk hydrodynamics. You only quantize hydrodynamics when you're studying small excitations around a ground state. When you have a high entropy state, you don't quantize hydrodynamics. And that's what I have to say today. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much for the great talk. Uh, please uh, ask a question. Uh, actually, Actually, I have a question on the, this fermion picture, this map, and it's very interesting. So here in the matrix model side, you have uh, now M fermion because basically these eigenvalues are like uh, fermions. Right. But the, like, here, there you need to map to this matrix model or the, inver the uh, upside down potential, you need many. M fermions. So, but here, do you consider the in the JT gravity? Do you consider one fermion, or also you consider the infinite number of fermions? Ah, very good question. So, in fact, in the, on the JT gravity side, we have a single fermion field. Okay, okay. we have a single fermion field, and mm -hmm. the reason for that is that this is this work of Brezan et al. and Moore that if I take the matrix model and I have N fermions, single particles, okay, that gives rise to one fermion field, okay? Mm -hmm. And when you take the double scaling limit, everything becomes continuous, you get a real field theory, okay? Uh -huh. And you have a, a, you have a single fermion field, uh -huh. okay? So, uh, you could, the, on the field theory side, the relativistic field theory, you could give these fields indices and you would have more fermions, more fermion fields. And you can do that here too. Um, you just, you know, you, you take the model as, as it stands, you, you take the um, uh, individual fermion fields, map them into a matrix model, and so you have a set of non-interacting matrix models, but then mm -hmm. the SYK interactions will couple them together, okay? Yeah. So for example, in the linear dilaton problem, where the problem I studied in 2015, what I did was people had studied exactly soluble one plus one dimensional string theory, and it was equivalent to this matrix model and to the single fermion field, field theory. Mm -hmm. That model has no black holes in it, even mm -hmm. though linear dilaton gravity has black hole solutions. So what I showed there was that if you took many fermion fields instead of just one, so it looks like a whole bunch of decoupled copies of one plus one dimensional string theory, mm -hmm. 
But then in the fermion language, you add interactions between them concentrated at the top of the potential. Okay. Then you get a model that has things that behave like black hole excitations. They're large entropy metastable excitations that destroy all the conservation laws of the previous model. Okay. So it, it's a very similar logic, but there I had to introduce many fermion fields. Here we can get all the physics with just a single fermion field. You could introduce more if you'd like. And then can you also apply your the uh, analysis to the like a genus expansion? Yeah, as you know, this uh, JT gravity when people <laughs> talk about the, this matrix model, they consider like a genus expansion and so on. So it's kind of uh, well, you're you're thinking about the Schenker Stanford. Um, yeah, uh, exactly. There okay. and okay. then you okay. add a okay. No, so there, there, there's there's a whole story that has to be told about that. <clears throat> so in our uh, quantization of JT gravity in Euclidean space, we do not consider wormhole geometries, okay? Uh, I see, okay. Okay. I think... Now, where do wormhole geometries come from? So um, wormhole geometries very explicitly in the SYK models, the wormhole geometries come from summing over random couplings, okay? Yes, in, from the point of the SYK, yes. From the point of view of SYK. So there's a, a way to think about this that uses, I'm going to call it folklore from quantum chaos, okay? Which is, and I don't know the extent, I don't know the quantum chaos literature well enough to, know the extent to which this is proved, okay? But you can find it said in all over the quantum chaos literature that summing over random couplings is equivalent to time averaging, okay? Yeah. It does yeah. the same kind of smoothing out. If you think about the spectral form factor, okay? okay. The real spectral form factor of any model has all of these jumps up and down and so on, and you smooth them out either by time averaging or by summing over random couplings, okay? So thinking about it that way, I wrote a paper about a year ago where um, you can think about um, where wormhole geometries, and this was actually, there's a, there's a beautiful paper by uh, Brian Swingle and uh, Weiner, I think his name is, um, which did this first and kind of gave me the idea. Um, if you look at the, um, the calculation of the so-called um, ramp in the spectral form factor, which is the one wormhole contribution, mm -hmm. in, in condensed matter models, you can get that from hydrodynamics, okay? So Swingle and Weiner showed that very explicitly from a bunch of models. And then when you think about that, it's very clear why you might get such a thing out of hydrodynamics. So in, in um, uh, <clears throat> the, the derivation of hydrodynamics from quantum mechanics, what you actually get is not hydrodynamics. You get hydrodynamics with a stochastic source, okay? Uh, and yeah. you, the, the real-time solution of hydrodynamics with a stochastic source, it, it gives rise to a Markov equation, okay? Mm -hmm. And you can write the solution of the Markov equation as a Euclidean path integral, mm -hmm. okay? And then when you do that, and if you study the spectral form factor approximated in hydrodynamics, where by, by the definition of hydrodynamics, you're averaging over microscopic time scales, um, in, and you do that time average, you see you get connected contributions. And those are the connected contributions that give you the, the leading um, wormhole solution. Now, 
if you do it for multiple spectra, you know, you take multi-point spectral correlation functions. This leads to the, the multi-throated trumpet geometries. So it, it leads to um, geometries that don't have any handles, but they have an arbitrary number of boundaries, okay? Mm -hmm. You don't get out of this the, the handle. So the, the single uh, wormhole, of course, you can think of that as a handle, but it's really just a space with two boundaries, okay? So when what, what the connection to the multi-handle geometries, I think the only argument I could come up with is the following, that the, the um, contribution of the multi-handle geometries to all orders in the genus expansion is completely determined by the spectral distribution by the, you know, the, the spectrum, the average spectrum of the random matrix, okay? okay? And so once you know what that is, which you know already from the single wormhole or the, the multi-boundary geometries, you're guaranteed that you're gonna get the, the higher handles correct. And, and um, I just don't, they, it doesn't come, directly as a formula from hydrodynamics, but, but you can see how you're going to get a structure like that coming out, okay? So that, that's, that's the, my understanding of the genus stuff. And of course, the way I've told it to you, you can do it for any model whatsoever in the world. Mm -hmm. But one thing that this makes clear to you is that if I think about quantum gravity, not some hydrodynamic approximation to quantum gravity, but quantum gravity, you don't include the wormholes at all. Oh, okay. okay. So in our field theory way of thinking about this model, we only took the, the two AD, um, hyperbolic plane geometries in the Euclidean path integral. Anything else would have been inconsistent with factorization and so on. And it's not what you expect from a real quantum mechanics model, even though it will come out of time averaging or coupling constant averaging. So that, that's what I have to say on that subject. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, is there uh, any other question? A follow-up question. Uh, so sorry, um, so are you saying that based on your calculation, you can explain the ramp behavior, some chaotic behavior? I, I can't explain it on the basis of what I told you about today. Mm -hmm. What I'm telling you is that Swingle and Weiner explained the ramp on the basis of hydrodynamics in a very general way. Um, and uh, I, I can uh, I can send Jung Yi a, a reference to that paper if you'd like. Um, so the ramp can be calculated hydrodynamically. And um, I, I wrote a little follow-up paper to the Swingle Weiner paper on that sort of, they, they had to make a, a guess and ansatz about how to do, you know, how to take hydrodynamics and calculate the ramp. And I gave an argument justifying what they did, basically. Um, the, let me ask you in this way. Is it, does your calculation take into account ever repulsion effect? I mean, well, as far as I understand, the wormhole geometry seems to take into account level repulsions for the energy spectrum, between the energy spectrum. Level repulsion, yeah. Oh. We cannot isolate. Well, no. yeah. I mean, in in our calculation, um, there, you know, at the end of the day, okay, um, if you ask me to calculate the spectral form factor for our final model, I had various stages in this model where I built it up starting from field theory and then I mapped field theory into something and then I 
put in cutoffs and so on. I ended up with the final model that had SYK interactions in it. So at the end of the day, if you want to calculate the partition function in this model for an equilibrium state, you will end up calculating a particular SYK partition function, which of course has all the effects of level repulsion and so on in it, okay? Um, you won't be doing it by a gravity calculation. You won't be doing it the way Shaker uh, and, and Stanford, and um, I'm, I'm really sorry, I'm forgetting the other guy's name, but um, uh, it, it's not done that way. But it, it, of course, the quantum mechanics has level repulsion in. Okay, so, so our, our calculation was basically um, not about that. Our calculation was really showing how that picture of the partition function, which is correctly given by the SYK model in our way of doing things, is compatible with having a large radius ADS geometry as we expect for a large charge Weissner Nordstrom black hole. And in, in our version of the model, which is not just SYK, I can also describe transient states where things actually propagate in the bulk. Whereas in the, in the traditional way of thinking about SYK, you can't really do that because the bulk geometry is thought of as not being large scale. Everything is, there's no low energy effective field theory approximation to it. Our model has a low energy effective field theory approximation, which describes what's going on in the bulk of the large geometry. If you look at what happens to any one of those states in the bulk, it returns to an equilibrium state. And that equilibrium state is correctly described by SYK. And we don't have anything to add to the actual calculation of the equilibrium in SYK, okay? Where our calculations all had to do with things that go on in our model that don't happen in the SYK model and that describe propagation that's well described by effective field theory in the bulk of ADS2. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is there any other uh, urgent question? Uh, if not, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much for inviting me to talk. Uh,